Hi, this is Professor Lapuma of the New Jersey Institute of Technology, recording for my technical communications course and drawing on material from my text, Fundamentals of Undergraduate Education and Learning. We're going to discuss a little bit about proposals, which is one of the most common technical writing tasks that you'll be asked to do, especially in a school. But beyond that, it's something that many people don't realize they have to do when in the work world and throughout many different situations. There are a number of web pages and textbooks and other resources available to talk about the idea of specifically what goes in a proposal. So this is just a general overview to help you understand how it interfaces with the rest of what we're talking about in class. So let's begin with the first idea of making a proposal. And what do you have to think about? When you make a proposal, again, you have to think about what what is your goal? And the goal is really driving this because many times a proposal simply states what you want, why you want it, and why you can do it. And so then on the other side of that, you have to identify the target and situation so you can better accomplish your goal. And so by identifying the target, who the proposal is going to, and the situation, meaning what is their area that they're going to look at, when and where and how it's going to get into them, really affects how you create your package so that your goal can be achieved. Now, beyond that, what some of the things that are really important in your proposal is to pick the correct tone because your attitude is very vital. Many times proposals are very short. Sometimes you have to write an even shorter pre-proposal or a one-line idea of a pitch before you even talk anything about your actual proposal. And so for us, this idea is very important of what is the correct tone. And I can't tell you because, again, it relates to your target and situation. Whenever possible, try to be professional and at the same time somewhat engaged and enthusiastic. You don't want to be overly enthusiastic, but to be positive so that it comes across that you are interested in doing the project, in getting something that will benefit the target and what they want. And that really goes to thinking about what does a target want. In many cases, in some types of proposals, the target is very clear about what they want. They issue something called a request for proposal, meaning they're saying, we have this money or we have this need, please send us proposals. In other times, the proposals aren't so clearly done. Sometimes your target will come to you and say this. Other times, as many people think about, it, you know, when you go for a job, you're making a proposal to them saying, hire me, it doesn't do it. Your resume, even though you may not think about it, is a proposal. It's listing what it is you can do to get this. And so the more you're clear about this idea of what your target wants and showing them that you have it and can deliver it in a way that they want is very important. So let's talk about the three types of proposals that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about sales proposals, research proposals, and then self-interest proposals. And so the first one we're going to talk about here is this idea of a sales proposal. And this usually deals with goods or services or both. And if you think about it, when you go to the store, they're making you an offer. And a proposal in its most simplest sense is just that, an offer to you, right? This is what I want to do. And so you're saying... Based upon, if you give me this, I'll give you that. Goods for us are any physical items. You go to buy an iPod. A service is that idea that someone will do something for you. You'll get a protection plan, a maintenance plan. And so many times, sales proposals bring together those two ideas to package together this idea that it's an exchange. And so what they're saying is, in exchange for your money, we will give you this goods or we will provide you this service. At the most high level in corporations, many times a sales proposal, if agreed upon by both parties, becomes a bid and then a contract. So that your proposal goes in with a strict set of numbers and details and then becomes, if everyone signs off on it, the actual contract which you are held to. So as you create the sales proposal, you have to think about what it is you can do for the price that you offer. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is this idea of a research proposal. And this really asks for supplies or consent. What we mean by this is that, especially at universities, many times there is money out there to be gotten. And what you're making a case for is that if you give us money, then we can spend time doing something. 
when that's support. Sometimes you don't even need money. You just need leave of absence. You need time. So they're willing to give you time so you can do something. Other times you want physical equipment. So you're writing and saying, in order to further my research in this field, I need your consent to spend my money on this. And so though it's not exactly a goods or services, this idea of research says you're making a case that you have the ability to do research, to solve a problem, to identify a problem that a company may not even know they have. And in exchange for the time and money they're willing to give you, you will spend your energies researching and producing these results. Now the last kind of proposal is one that most college students are familiar with. And these are self-interest proposals. And these deal with things that you want or deal with personal ideas and attitudes, right? So. One of the things you want to think about is your resume. I mentioned it before. Your resume is really a self-interest proposal. What you're saying is, I would like a job. I'm offering you myself. This is what I have. And so as we come together with this, what you want to think about is that the self-interest proposal is really about getting what you want in the most narrow sense because you're not offering either a third party something in exchange for it other than yourself, and you're not offering to solve a problem. The self-interest proposal is also much broader because it can include things for another person. If I write a recommendation letter for you, I'm proposing that you are good. If I write an application for you to win a Nobel Prize or to get an award or to get a scholarship, those are all proposals that are self-interest. Usually self-interest proposals are either very narrow in form because I'm filling out an application or very open because there's no set form for it. The most common of these three that has a request for a proposal are research. Research grants often elicit requests for proposals. Sales proposals, on the other hand, are often done more as a pitch. And a pitch is often a very short, sometimes in person, sometimes done in a um, text medium, idea of giving you an offer and getting back feedback, and then we negotiate a price. And so even though all of these can be seen as proposals, because of the situation that exists around them, they have different demands placed on them. So as you do a proposal, what you want to think about is each one of these calls for different things to go into them. Oftentimes, a sales proposal has much more emotion tied to it. Many times, a research proposal depends on your experience, history, and your ability to make a clear argument about the reasonable nature of your request. The self-interest proposal can have a lot to do with your own personal attributes and how you are selling yourself as the person who can do this. So what we really want to think about is how you can make your case. So, one of the most important things at the beginning is to clearly state your purpose if that is what you want to do. Now, sometimes in a sales proposal, we say that that's not what, you know, so the salesman lied to me, bait and switch. But we're trying to avoid those false and deceptive advertising, the subliminal messages, these ideas that come in connection with these things. We're talking about making a clear proposal to be on an even ground and have fair competition. So at the beginning, you want to clearly state your purpose, what it is you are proposing and what it is you hope to get in return. Then the next idea is that you have to really talk about your, your idea of evidence. And in this case, evidence is used very generally to mean what it is that shows you can either accomplish a task, you have details of the specifics of the thing you're offering, whether it be a good or service, you have a clear idea of what it is you need to do and why you need to do it, how that equipment is. This idea of evidence is the things that support your purpose that says, yes, I can give or do what it is I'm saying. Now, beyond that, we also have to support claims. Anytime you make a claim in your evidence that says, I have this item or I can do it for this price, you often need to provide support which backs up your evidence of something you're claiming. And so a lot of times, these claims are what the main target interest is. So they want to see not just what you say you can do, but how you can support it. And for us, especially in classes, when you write a proposal, it is these claims that the professor will look at to see that you have went and done research to support it, that other people agree with you, or they see the product. In other cases, the claims aren't as important because you have the physical item there. And when you say, I can build this, you bring them a partially completed model or a partially completed done. One big thing that brings together these three aspects is the idea that when you make a proposal, many times you do 5 to 15% of the work before you've ever gotten 
any agreement to do it. You have to do the research and the legwork and put in time and effort in order to show the target you are already on the way to giving them what they will get in the end. You are on the way to helping them accomplish the goal that you are proposing to them to do. So then the last thing we really want to think about is that you have to end with a clear request and call to action. What we mean by this is the first part of this gives them that 5 to 15% of the work and says, look, I have done this and this is why I'm asking for it and here is what I can do for you and here's my evidence and here are my claims that have been supported. Right? It's all this, all this argument setting up. But at the end, you have to clearly stay that in order to give you this, I want X amount of money or X amount of time or X amount of credit. And then a call to action. This idea that you have to then, after that, say, if you agree with my proposal, sign the paper, send me an email, set up a meeting, some call to action. In the same way that in your cover letter that we talked about early on in the class, has a call to action at the end about your interview with that resume, every proposal needs some clear and explicit call to action that tells the target what is the next step to take in the process. And that's what you need to do so that we can understand what it is to have that successful proposal move forward and move into an action plan. Thank you.